Excuse me. <clears throat> I take that frog for a ride. <clears throat> well, I am thankful for his mercy and grace to me. 27, almost 27 years I've walked with the Lord and how thankful I am for his mercies that were new this morning again. Uh, Pastor, I did want to uh, uh, present you with something this morning. I know you couldn't make it to the ladies' meeting. And uh, we had such a blessed time. I know you're a Tennessee fan, so do you mind? I'd like to Thank present you. you with something. Would you open it? Oh, I certainly will. Oh. <laughs> Got the colors. Amen. Where are you, Sue? No, where are you? I know you would have liked to have been at the ladies' meeting. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Those who were here Wednesday night, you, you heard about that, right? That he wanted to come to the ladies' meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Estrogen patches used daily. <laughs> Welcome you back <laughs> 50 years from now. For 
those of you who were not in on that little joke, Wednesday night I was told at the Friday night meeting, Wednesday night pastor said he was not going to come to that ladies meeting with all that estrogen around. <laughs> So we gave him his dose. <laughs> My husband and I travel every long weekend. And usually, I'm the one to go out the door last and lock the front door. And sometimes, when I turn that key in the lock, the thought goes through my mind, I wonder if this is the last time I'll ever turn this key. You might say, well, that's a morbid thought. No, that's reality. Because the Bible says, what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then passeth away. I want you to know from my own lips, if this is my day to go out into eternity, I know where I'll be. There's a few more years to sow and reap, a few more years to smile and weep, a few more years to wake and sleep, and then eternity. There's a few more miles for weary feet, a few more trials. spend it. before I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. I thought I was forgotten. I thought God hated me. I hated the things that I did day after day, and yet I was powerless to do anything about it. There were times when I thought about taking my own life, but then I thought, who would care for my three children? like their mother. I wonder the people you live beside, you work beside, you shop with, do they feel forgotten? <laughs> Forgotten people see them everywhere. Ask the Lord to help you care. Tell him that you want to share. None too great and none too small. Jesus Just like you and me. Oh, no. 
forgotten people hurry on their way. They're sad and lonely. Look around. Emptiness is all they found. Every color rich and poor. Hide behind forgotten doors. Give them hope that there is more. Christ is what they're searching for what they've never known. Open up your eyes and see people just like you and me. Won't you help them willingly so that Forgotten people, will you only care? That's what it takes, isn't it? Forgotten people, see. Thank you so much for that beautiful music. We appreciate that today. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, the book of Galatians chapter 6. It's good to have Brother and Mrs. Walters with us today. Brother Walters has not been feeling well, and I'm glad that he's feeling better and they're with us today. We had lunch with Brother and Sister Carrie this week, and we went up to the house, and Brother Carrie said, let's sit down and talk a while. So while we talked about preaching, Miss Carrie and Sue talked about Gone with the wind, <laughs> exchanging little gifts. Now my daughter's coming up this week and they're going to the mall together. So I think I came out the loser in this one, but uh, I'm glad they had a good time together. Galatians chapter 6, we'll read verses 1 through 5. And I want to speak this morning on the subject, Bear One Another's Burdens. Bear One Another's Burdens. Galatians 6, beginning in verse 1 down through verse 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. There seems to be a contradiction between verse 2 and verse 5. Really there's not. Verse 2 is talking about helping one another with our burdens. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The word burdens there actually has the idea of a large boulder. And the idea is this, from time to time all of us have heavy loads to carry. If you'll look around you this morning and if you'll think about the person sitting beside you, they may be carrying a heavy load today. They may be carrying a heavy burden. And notice verse 1, we're called brethren. It is the responsibility of those of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ to help one another to carry the burdens of life. And I believe that we as God's family should be goal oriented in helping others to come to completion in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was talking to a couple this morning and I was pointing out the fact that when the Lord brings a couple together, He is to bring out the best in her and she is to bring out the best in Him in a, in a marriage relationship. And I believe in the church that we ought to bring out the best in one another. Amen? Amen? Too many times we bring out the worst in one another. 
And too many times we do not walk in the Spirit and we do not carry about us an aura of love and compassion. There's too much fussing and fighting in God's family. There's too much disunity in God's family. And so the Apostle Paul says to the church and says to brothers and sisters in Christ, bear one another's burdens. The person sitting by you this morning may need you. The person sitting by you this morning may be the one that will need your love, your compassion, and your care. And so I wonder as we go through the week, are we looking for folk who have burdens so that we can lift those burdens and so that we can help them? I've noticed down through the years that sometimes folk that seem like they have it all together, that seem like that they do not need the help, they really do. I've discovered that there are times that they need a shoulder to cry on. That there are times that they need someone just to listen. I do some counseling, but I don't have all of the answers. And I've discovered in the counseling office that sometimes folk who come into counseling just want someone to listen, someone to care. They just want to pour their heart out. And they'll say to me, I feel so much better. You've been such a help. And I'm saying to myself, I didn't say anything. I didn't say much at all. But just listening and giving a listening ear. You want someone to listen to you. You want to be heard. What a help it is sometimes just to be able to say to a friend, a confidant, this is my problem. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm facing. And sometimes by just verbalizing it to someone else, you come up with your own solution. But just someone to care and someone to help you with your problem, someone to help you with your difficulty. So here's the idea of bearing one another's burdens. Notice how he phrases it. Bear ye one another's burdens. Now watch. If I do that, I fulfill the law of Christ. You know what I'm doing? I'm obeying Jesus. You know what I'm doing? I'm being like Him when I bear one another's burdens burdens. The thought comes to me that when Peter denied the Lord, there was that look from the Savior. Do you remember that? There was that glance from the Lord Jesus. But if you'll remember after that, the Bible says that Peter went fishing. At least seven other disciples said, we're going also. They went back to their old lifestyle. They went back to their old way of living. They went back to their jobs. Jesus had called them away from fishing on the lake and fishing for men. Peter said, I'm going back to my old lifestyle. But if you'll remember, Jesus was on the shore. Do you remember that? And all night long they had caught nothing. And Jesus had breakfast waiting for those men. Do you remember these words from Jesus? Go tell the disciples and Peter. What was Jesus doing? He was bearing the burdens of another. He was helping another with his burdens. And so when we bear one another's burdens, we're being just like Christ. How many times do we say something like this? Well, he deserved it. How many times do we say something like this? You got yourself into it, you get yourself out of it. How many times do we say to someone, well, maybe you'll be more cautious next time. Maybe you'll be more careful next time. And there is an element of standing up for your faults and standing up for your sin and taking responsibility. There is an element there. But there's also an element there of brothers and sisters needing our help and needing our care. And so he says, bear one another's burdens. But then look down in verse 5. And he says this, for every man shall bear his own Burden. It seems contradictory, but it is not. Verse 2, we're helping one another bear burdens, being like Christ. But in verse 5, he's talking about the heavy burdens of ministry. When it comes to the ministry that God has called you to do, that is your burden, that is your responsibility, that is your weight, if you will, that is your load, if you will. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. My wife is the only mother in our home. That is her burden. That is her responsibility to be the mother in the home. My daughter is to see from her what a woman is to be. My daughter is to see from her what a wife is to be. And she bears the burden of being the mother in the home. You're in the auditorium this morning and you're a father. You're the only father in your home. You are to mirror what a man should be to your daughter and to your boys. You are to mirror 
uh, to men out there what a father is to be. And you're the only father in your home, and that is your burden. You're to bear that burden. That's the cross that Jesus has given you to bear. Maybe I could illustrate it this way. I'm the only pastor of this church. That's my burden. God has called me to the pastorate, and this church has called me to be the pastor. I'm the only pastor of this church. That's my burden. You cannot pastor uh, this church. Although I have some good men to assist me and to stand beside me and behind me, sometimes way behind me, but standing behind me. And uh, I thank God for that. And I thank God for the deacons. And I thank God for good ladies and men uh, who are here who I can ask advice from and who we can use their gifts and their talents. But when it boils down to it, I am the one who will answer to God for this church. And by the way, since I will bear the burden of giving an account for this church, I will pastor this church. Uh, one of our men said the other night, uh, jokingly, uh, said that, well, yeah, you're the head of the church, but we'll tell you how to run it. I hope he was kidding. <laughs> I, I, he was kidding, but he better be, because I will be the pastor as long as God has called me to be here. That's my burden. That's my responsibility. And I'll take the leadership in that. Uh, you may be a Sunday school teacher. Uh, you may work in the nursery. You, the, you may work in the school. Uh, but that is your burden. That is your calling. And so there's that heavy burden of ministry uh, that you are to carry. And uh, the Lord wants you to carry that load faithfully. So others will see that and will see that there are men and women who are in the ministry who are doing the job and are doing it faithfully. So we are to bear one another's burdens. We are to be there one for another. Now, if you will, put down three thoughts out of this passage of Scripture this morning. Let me give you a simple outline and we'll move along in this matter of bearing one another's burdens. Number one, write down this simple phrase, what we should do. What we should do when it comes to bearing one another's burdens. Well, uh, actually, uh, we're to look for those who are in trouble, those who are in difficulty, those who are having a hard time, and there are many areas where we can assist them. For instance, in the area of the emotional. In the area of the emotional. The devil, in my opinion, has a great insight in the area of men and women's emotions. And he understands that the body, soul, and spirit are close neighbors. And I think the devil understands that if he can get us disturbed emotionally and get into our emotions so that we will not be able to know the difference between fact and fiction, so that we'll not be able to understand the difference in what is faith and what is folly, because the devil understands that many times when there's a battle between the will and emotions, usually emotions win out. And that's why you and I need to walk in the Spirit so we'll not be ruled by emotions. And so that we'll not be ruled by feelings. Now thank God for feelings. And thank God for emotions. Aren't you glad that we have a God who is a, a God of emotion? He loves. He hates. Uh, he's in control. Uh, he cares for us. Uh, he cares for me like a, a father would care for his son, like a mother would care for her daughter. I, I believe that he loves us with an emotion. Uh, God is not in, in heaven stoic uh, with no feelings, with no emotions. I believe he loves us with an emotion. Uh, Saturday, usually, my grandson and I spend most of the day together. Uh, he's at that age where we really enjoy being together, and uh, I just love going to the store and buying toys for him to play with. I really enjoy that. Yes, he plays with them. Of course, I get to play with them too. And I just love it when we, well, last night we took a walk around the lake, and uh, when he says something to me like this, Grandfather, Granddad, I love you, that gets me emotional. And if, if, you're, if you're alive, uh, you get emotional at something like that too. Well, our Heavenly Father has emotions, and I'm glad that we do. But many times, if we're not careful, we'll let emotions control us. Emotions will be out of control. Uh, Romans chapter 8 talks about the Holy Spirit coming alongside us uh, to help us. And He knows how uh, to lead us in our prayer life. And, and He acts as a spiritual doctor to help us uh, in our life. 
And so when we see people having problems in the area of emotion, we need to be there as a stabilizing force. We can listen to them. And if they want to cry, let them cry. And if they want to vent, let them vent. And even if they want to get angry at times, let them get angry. But be there to help them and maybe give Scripture and to give facts and to give prayer and a shoulder to cry on. And we can lift the burdens of people uh, in the area of the emotions, in the area of the physical. There are people that have physical needs that should be attended to. Uh, I thank God we have a, a nursing home ministry. I thank the Lord that we have people that will go up and just take little items to these people and will share with these folk. And we see that they have physical needs and we can help them there and we can care for them there. And uh, we're very kind to folk in that, in that area. There are financial needs uh, where we can lift one another's burdens. And let me just say this again, and let me strengthen what I've said many times before. I believe this church is where it is financially. I believe God has blessed it financially with a new property and in other ways because this church has been kind in reaching out to others and helping others. Not only reaching out to those in need, but reaching out to those in ministry uh, with ministry needs. I was talking to Elijah that's going to be with us tonight. He's going to give his report over in Romania. Come to find out Elijah and I have friends that we know well. As a matter of fact, my first associate pastor in Charleston has gone to Romania many times in a missions trip and they know one another. And so we, we got to know one another. And he was talking to me this week about, or this, uh, yes, this week about how the, the communists still are in control in Romania. And how that there is oppression from the communists even to this day. And he was telling me that just recently some Baptist men has been beaten in Romania uh, because of that and because of their stand for the Lord. And uh, I'm happy to have a financial part in helping men and women over there. Amen? Amen. And so what are we to do? Well, we are to uh, help one another uh, and, and to be kind to one another when they have emotional needs and physical needs and spiritual needs uh, and the rest. But... Look at one word in verse 1 that really tells us what we should do when others are having various kinds of problems. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore. Restore such a one. We should have a ministry of restoration. Every one of us should be ministers of restoration. When we see people with problems, when we see people with cares, we should reach out to them. When we see people who have gone astray and have wandered away from the Lord, we should be ministers of restoration to them and reach out for them. Notice please, he said restore. He did not say rejoice. Isn't it a sad thing that when some people sin, when some people fall, when some people come up short, there are people in the church who are ready to almost rejoice and almost are gleeful that this person failed, that this person is having problems. What a sad commentary on Baptists. What a sad commentary on Christians when we see people who are having problems and we rejoice that they're having problems. That is certainly not Christ-like. It's certainly not Christian. And it is certainly something that should not take place in the family of God. Amen. Now just because you don't like someone or because maybe they rub you the wrong way. And down through the years I'll have to be very quick to admit that there have been some preachers that, uh, that I just personally could not fellowship with. And there's some things that goes on in fundamentalism and in the independent circles that bother me. Back some years ago people were getting telephone calls. All across the country they're getting telephone calls and this question was asked, are you for? And then the name of this preacher was given. And if you would not answer in the affirmative, then you were written off. Are you for? Well, I'm for Jesus Christ. And I'm for God's man and I'm for the church, but I'm not for lifting up a man, I'm for lifting up Christ. And obviously I cannot go along with that kind of a thing, but certainly if this man makes mistakes or if this man falls, it's not or should not be in me to rejoice that he fell or to rejoice that he's having problems. And down through the years it seems as if, and I'm just going to, just going to say it, down through the years it seems to be that independents and Baptists have, have been at one another's throat. Should that really be? Now let me say this, 
we stand for the truth. And if there are liberals, we do not stand for liberals. If there is false doctrine, we do not stand for false doctrine. But we sure stand for a brother. If a man is preaching the truth, should we stand against him? Absolutely not. I think we should love one another. Amen? Amen. We have harmed the cause of Christ because too many of us Baptists have fought one another right. rather than love one another. And we should forgive one another and be kind one to another. And the Bible says we're to restore. We are to restore. We're to restore. We're not to battle one another. And we're not to rejoice when someone falls. Notice again, he did not say reveal. Now, obviously, if a Christian is living in sin, he should face up to that sin. And if he repents, then he should be forgiven. Now, maybe just because he repents, you don't, do not move him immediately back into a former position. There should be probably a time of, of viewing, a time of, of building up, a time of restoration to see uh, and to help this brother or this sister get back uh, into the place of fellowship with the Lord and then help him to move on. We're to restore. But too many people, they rejoice. And too many people are so quick to reveal. Well, look what he did. Look what she's doing. We better be very, very careful. You better be very careful how you treat other people. I need to be very careful how I treat other people. Look again at verse 1, brethren. If any man be overtaken in a fault. Now, by the way, let me pause there and say uh, there's a difference in being overtaken and going headlong with eyes open into a fault. There's a big difference. If you've made up your mind this morning that you're going to backslide, there's not much I can do for you. That's right. That's right. If you've made up your mind, you're going to backslide. Let me say this. If you've made up your mind you're going to backslide, you will suffer the chastening of the Lord. Right. And you may be in danger of losing your ministry. Right. Completely and totally. But he says, here is a brother, a brother that is overtaken with a fault. In other words, what he's saying is this. You come up on or you fall beside. It's not what you wanted. It's not what you had desired to do. But you were overtaken. You came up on. And in a weak moment, at a moment of deception, at a moment of, of weakness, you fell. Well, that's, it's not a, a, something that you want to live with. You want forgiveness. You want to move on. And so it's the responsibility of a brother to help you to be restored into the family of God. But watch what he says. He says, restore you which are spiritual. And by the way, the word spiritual there has the idea, those of you that are governed by the Spirit. Let me pause for just a moment and say, how many people in the choir this morning are governed by the Spirit? How many people that are sitting out here in the audience this morning, you're governed by the Spirit? We're either governed by the flesh or governed by the Spirit. Now let me say this, those who have fallen, it is the responsibility of those who are spiritual to restore them. Now those who want to rejoice in their fall and those who want to reveal them in their fall, they're not going to help. But it is those who are governed by the Spirit. Now, am I governed by the Spirit? Is our staff governed by the Spirit? Too many times we see someone fall and we just rejoice in it and we want to reveal it and we want to make it very difficult for them. We want it to make it hard on them. What did Jesus say? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Aren't you glad He's the God of the second chance, the third chance, Amen. the fourth, the fifth, the sixth? Aren't you glad of that? Where would Jonah have been had not he been the God of the second chance? Where would the Apostle Paul be had he not been the God of the second chance? And so he says, those of you who are governed by the Spirit, you are to restore. But watch how he says it. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. In other words, as you do this, you better give heed to how you're living. Give heed to where you are spiritually. So he did not say rejoice, he did not say reveal, and he did not say react. Well, kick him out of the church. He's gone. He's useless. She's useless. He never will amount to anything anyway. And too many times we react without getting all of the facts. Too many times we react before we ask, Lord, what will you have us do? 
And so he says we're to help those. So he did not say rejoice. He did not say reveal. He did not say react. But he said restore. Now a doctor understands that terminology because it means the setting of a bone. A sailor understands that terminology because he's talking about getting his nets ready for the next fishing expedition. And so you're setting a bone. Uh, you're getting ready uh, your nets for the next uh, fishing uh, expedition. He understands uh, what we're talking about here. Now let me pause and say something and say this very kindly to you if, if you'll let me. Listen carefully. The legalist has nothing to restore with. The legalist has nothing to restore with. The legalist follows a set of rules and regulations, yeses and noes. The legalist usually follows a man who is over.